This is, is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote idea to the meaning of the word? Sup? Hey, hey, what's happening? So for the listeners out there, don't turn your dial. You are on the correct podcast. Jason and Chris are both out today. And I thought about monologuing, but Jason has some pent up anxiety about me doing that for some reason. So I texted Colin and was like, hey, Colin, I need a co-host. And Colin was like, let's do it. And here we are. So Colin, thanks for coming and joining me. No problem. Here we are live and direct. Live and direct. It sounds like you had an interesting morning. Yeah, we got a couple of reports of some things in the GoRails Discord related to GoRails. So I was going to fix those today. And meanwhile, on Twitter, some people were asking me about my dot files. And I realized like I had never moved my actual ZSHRC into like my dot files directory and sim linked it. So I went to go do that. But when I copied the original file and pasted it over, it only took like maybe half of the file. So I was missing right. a whole bunch of stuff. So I totally broke my system for a while. So I was like scrambling to get that all set back up, got that finally set back up again, and then had to like just deal with some other small issues while going back through things. Like I ran to ASDF, the configuration there for the install path wasn't copied back over. So I had to go find that command, paste that in. And then see, I had to uninstall Postgres, like the PG jam and reinstall it. Then I was finally back up and elbowed and running and able to work on some things. So we had like an issue in GoRails where like we have an RSS feed that goes out, but it's only like the free episodes, but it's literally only the free episodes, which includes like all future episodes, things that aren't released to everybody yet. Yeah, I just had to go slap another scope on that and say, hey, in addition to only the free episodes, I want also only the published ones to show up in this feed. So that's been my morning. How's yours been? I'll get to my morning in a second. I do want to say the dot files thing specifically, like I'm at this place with my dot files where in the very beginning, I didn't understand what was going on. I kept slapping things in there and didn't know what was working. And then one day I decided to like truly understand my dot files and I rewrote them from scratch and things are in a much better place. But in between that process, I was like, oh, I want to do a better job of publishing my dot files to my dot file repo, which I have. It just hasn't been updated in a long time. And it's very out of sync with what I'm using. And I found this like package or this tool online that was like, hey, we will automatically go through and grab all your dot files and automatically sim link them for you and stick them in a folder for you. And we'll do all this great stuff and automatically add it to Git. And I was like, this is perfect. And I just wanted to see what it would do. So I ran the command, initialize everything, but I forgot to pass dry run flag to it. So it actually ran the command and what I didn't realize it was doing, because I didn't realize exactly what it was doing. What it did was it took every file that it knew how to find. And this included application config files. So like for Discord and for Safari or not Safari, but you know, all these applications and then mm -hmm. all the dot files and then even some system preferences. And it sim linked them all into a folder. And once the command ran, I looked at the folder and I was like, ah, eh, this isn't exactly what I'm looking for. And without even thinking about it, I just deleted it. And Amazing. that had the effect of deleting all of those application settings, all of those system preferences, all the dot files, everything was gone. The computer was just absolutely foobarred. And I had nice. to reinstall iOS, rebuild the whole computer. I lost at least a full day of work. And yeah. ever since <laughs> then, I've been paranoid about sim linking and I've just not updated my dot files in Git, but I ought to do that soon. Oh man, that's terrible. Yeah, today was my first experience with a similar thing to that. So I'm curious, so what was the dry run? How would that operate? The dry run would have basically just showed me what it was going to do. Like it would have said uh, like for right. all these applications and all these config files, these are the files and like basically listed all of them. Mm -hmm. And so it wouldn't have actually run. It would have just showed me what it would have output. Just kind of like output to your terminal or something like yeah. what it's going to do. Yeah. Okay. And that's what I wanted to do and did not do. I didn't truly understand what sim linking was doing. Like I understood like basically, but I'd never actually made a sim link. So I don't know. I, it happened so fast. Yeah. As soon as I deleted the file, I don't remember if I RM or F'd it or what, but I wasn't able to get it back. Or maybe I was able to get the actual files back, but because all the sim links were broken and I didn't know where they all came from, 
then it was just kind of messed up. So I don't remember exactly what happened after I deleted it because it was kind of just a blur of, oh shit, right? what have I done? Yeah. But I'm pretty happy with my dot files these days. It's a lot cleaner and they're pretty fast too. So yeah, I'll have to push that up sometime. Make it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm interested to look more into other people's dot files. I think ThoughtBot has theirs. Yeah. Out there publicly. I've looked at their laptop config, I think. I think. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff in there. A lot of stuff. I have no idea what's going on, but I'm interested to learn more. But at the same time, I'm actually rather enjoying a like very minimal config setup with things. I think I've been going more that direction as time goes on, like trying to simplify my setup and not have a bunch of things that I have. I don't want a million key mappings to remember or anything like that. Yeah, it's been yeah. fun to explore though. I use a tool called ZNAP, which is a faster alternative to OhMyZSH. A lot of people are probably using OhMyZSH or something similar, but I use ZNAP and it doesn't do as much magic for you, which I kind of like because it kind of forces me to understand what's actually happening and to more so understand of like, this is the load order. The Z mm-hmm. profile loads first. And then the, I can't remember all of that. I know there's ZSHRC, Z profile. There's a few other ones. It was like, this is mm-hmm. the load order. You can specify this path so that you can put your ZSHRC somewhere else. And you can understand like what these functions are doing and how they're loaded and the comp init stuff that I never understood. Like it's definitely dropped down a level, but it's a lot faster, I find. And also just kind of forced me to learn. And mm-hmm. so my dot files are pretty minimal. They're also very organized. I'm happy with it, but... As far as like the aliases go, I've been trying to like basically look through my alias list every month or two and just prune. If I'm not using it and I can't remember ever using it, just delete it. And if I can add it back if I need to, but for now, like, let's just get rid of it and removing like all the crazy plugins I had because a lot of them were just literally just adding aliases. And so I was like, I don't need this OhMyZSH plugin when I could just copy the aliases out of it and don't have to worry about loading it in and all this Mm -hmm. other stuff. So yeah, definitely. So I'm using Vim. I don't have a lot of plugins installed, honestly. Like I know I have more like theme plugins than anything. You know, I think I have like four or five theme plugins and maybe three or four actual plugins. By the way, thanks T Pope. I think everything everything I have is all T Pope stuff. I have his Vim Rails plugin, but honestly, I really don't use it. I thought about removing it because I really don't use it that much. I mean, if at all, honestly. I use it when I first installed it, but I just find that I don't really need to do the functionality that it provides, at least right now. So what does it provide? If you're in a model file, for example, you can jump to like the related test file, or if you're in a controller action, you can jump to the related view for that action. One thing I actually do really like that I haven't been able to use a bunch. I just thought it was cool. You can take a section of code and I forget what the command is, but basically you hit this command and it will chop that out and add it into a partial for you. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I thought that one was really cool. And it'll replace the line with like Mm -hmm. the render call to the partial. Cool idea, like cool approach. I like that kind of stuff, but I think I maybe used it once, you know, in actuality. Right. But yeah, so I was going to say though, too, with aliases, I'm pretty minimal there too. I think I have just aliases for like all the basic Rails things and like get things that I do. It's just like short mnemonics for typing things. You know, like if I want to generate a model, I don't want to have to type out Rails generate or Rails G model blah. So I just do RG, MOD, and then whatever I want to do. And it's something. I find like using mnemonics to be helpful because if I ever need to write out the full command, like if I'm not on my computer or like especially during a screencast or something. Yeah. I try not to use aliases in recording screencasts because I want everybody to see like the commands I type. So having the mnemonic named aliases, like I could still remember what the full command is. Yeah. I'm interested to hear what you do there. Just like you, I used to have tons and tons and tons of aliases. And now I have basic Rails ones. I don't have to generate models a lot, so I don't have one for that. But it's like migrating, mm. console, just very simple things. And just like you, though, I also kind of use a mnemonic. So like if I want to run the migrations, it's RDBM. Oh, that's mine too. <laughs> that's oh, exactly mine. And then I have a RDBMS for the status option there. Yeah. And see, I don't check the migration status a lot, so I don't have that. I haven't needed it. And then the ones I use the most outside of the Git ones, like I have all sorts of Git ones, which are probably pretty common for most people, or at least they probably look just like most people's Git aliases. Like 
GC and GUP, which is get upstream pull. Maybe I do a lot of rebasing as well. I have a few for that, but the biggest ones I use are like, I have bundler alias to B. I have yarn alias to Y. Bundle install is BI. Me too. BI. Bundle exec is BE. Oh, I have BEX for mine. Mm, Yeah. I like BE just because it's quicker. (laughs) I don't know. I use bundle exec a lot. So yeah, same. It's a good one. Those are like the biggest ones I use really. So really just rails and get for the most part. Forget. Yeah, same here. And a couple of bundler ones and the like a yarn one I have. Yeah. YI yarn install. Yeah. Which I guess I could just do yarn or Y, like you said. Yeah. But it's helpful for me for the like the full mnemonic thing. The other thing I was gonna say, like the Git ones that I have, I started out with just simple aliases, but then I realized like certain times I needed to do certain things with variations of these commands. So I started converting some of them from aliases into functions, like shell functions. Yeah. So like typically most of the time when I'm working on something, I want to push my current branch to origin or to a certain remote. So I have like a function set up to where I can just do like GP. And if I don't give it any other arguments, it'll just take whatever current branch I'm on and push it to the origin remote. But alternatively, I can say GP some remote, and then it'll just push my origin to that remote instead. Isn't there a new setting in Git where it will automatically push it to the upstream? I think there is. Actually, I think by default it tries to go to origin. I don't remember. Yeah, so the Git option is called auto setup remote true under the push in your Git config. So that might potentially replace it because I hate having to do that too. I have a tool called the fuck. (laughs) (laughs) And whenever a command executes and then it gives you a suggested command, you can just type fuck. And it will give you the option of using that command and you can like scroll up and down to see what other ones it's suggesting. It's kind of helpful. But I also mostly just push from VS Code and it will do that automatically. I pulled up my dot files just to see real quickly and I'll tell you. So I have a few Git ones that are very basic for checking out, pulling, status, committing, rebase. Mm -hmm. I forgot about the rebase one. GRBC is git rebase continue, which I use a lot. Oh, nice. I alias like opening up VS code in the current directory, just C. Oh yeah, I do that with Vim. I just have V. Yep. Yep. We already talked about the bundler and yarn. I run Redis through ASDF. And so I have a command to start Redis in the background. It's called Redis start. I use Overmind a lot for managing processes through a proc file. So I have a few commands just for that. You know how in oh my ZSH, it will automatically set up tilde and it will take you to like the root and like dot dot and it will CD you. Right, 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 right. Yep. So I added a few of those, just like a few basic ones I use. A few Rails. Nice. I also have a command called up, which I took from my coworker, Seb, which does git pull. It does bundle check or bundle and then runs yarn and then runs the migrations. So I oh, will cool. like check out main and we do a lot of dependency updates and migrations and there's a lot of movement. So like I just run up and it will automatically get me situated. A couple of Heroku commands a few Bridgetown aliases, and then just like a few homebrew aliases. And that's pretty much it. Nice. That's really cool. I like the up one. I'm trying to think what the most recent one I did was. I think I, it was a Git one. I had like a, I think it's G fix. Mm-hmm. So like if I'm going to like merge master or whatever into the branch I'm working on, if there's conflicts, it'll open every conflict in its own tab and I can just work through them that way. Oh, it opens each one in a tab. And then it searches the first open file and puts you on the first line. You see all the arrows, yeah, like little brackets. It's where like ragged head or master or whatever, the main, whatever it is, it'll drop you right there. So you're at like the first conflict in that file. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm just fun. On the topic of functions, I used to have all these functions and then I deleted them because I'm like, I never remember that they're there. So I'm like, let's just delete all of them and add more as we get back started. Mm -hmm. I have a command to switch the Postgres version. I use ASDF for that as well. So I use that one a lot. But the other one that I wrote recently, which is kind of cool, is called GH labels for GitHub labels. Because what I found... Oh, yeah, yeah. I think I might have showed you this before. I think you did too. I have a set of GitHub labels that I like to use, and they're based off of the prefixes for conventional commits. And so what this command does is I basically have a list of all of the default GitHub labels like in a list. And then it iterates through that list and deletes all of them. And then it does GH label clone 
and then a repository. And what that command does, it uses the GitHub CLI and it takes all of the labels that are in the repository that you specify and it copies them into the current repository. So whenever I set up a new yep. Git repo, that's the command I'll run to like automatically set up the labels I want. Yeah, I remember you showing me this on one of our other calls. That one was really cool. Yeah, the GitHub CLI is great, honestly. Mm-hmm. It's gotten so much better than whatever it used to be. The new one is great and you can have plugins to it and everything. Nice. You use that one? Not very often. Oh man, I use it for so much. Because there's a command, like it's gh repo create. I want to create a repo from a, the code that I've just written without having to do the whole song and dance of like setting the upstream and then doing this and then blah, blah, blah. And like opening up GitHub and creating a repository, et cetera. If you're using the GitHub CLI, you can do gh repo create the name of the repo. And then you can pass either dash dash private or dash dash public. And then the key is doing dash dash source equals and then period. So that's saying use this current current directory, right? Yeah. Yep. Because by default, if you just type repo create, it'll just create the repo. And not put anything in it. And not do anything with it. Yeah. And the last flag is dash dash push. So gh repo create repo name dash dash public dash dash source equals period dash dash push. And that will take everything that's in your current directory, create a GitHub repo, push it up and make it a public or private. I got to get on that one. I like oh, that yeah. a lot. Oh yeah. It's great. Cause I create new repos constantly. So super helpful. It's super helpful yeah. to have like this command to automatically create my repo and then a command to automatically set up my labels. And then the GitHub repo is just ready to roll. Yeah. Cause I'm definitely doing it the old school way of just like going on to GitHub, creating the repo, copying like that middle box of like, Hey, I already have a repository initialized. I just want to push that one to this now. So I would love what you just talked about in my life. Yeah. The GitHub CLI, once I said, everyone who's not using it, you should definitely check it out because you can do some really cool stuff with it. Andrea wrote this code to use the GitHub CLI to find all of the PR she made in the last week and then use JQ to like parse it and turn it into like a format that she posts for her end of week update. Oh, that's a smart idea. Yeah, that's it's really cool. So lots of things you can do with that. Yeah, uh, I like that one a lot too. Other than that, my DAW files are pretty slim. I'm enjoying that part a lot. You're using the default Mac terminal, right? Yep. I used to use iTerm in the very early days of development. And then one of my coworkers wrote their own shell. And I used that for a long time. It's called Archipelago. It was written in React. It was an Electron, I think. It was just very minimal and slim. And he was my coworker and I wanted to fit in. So mm-hmm. I used it, but I actually really did enjoy it. And I used it for years. It wasn't until recently I switched to Warp. And mm-hmm. Warp is like a Rust-based terminal. Rust is all the craze these days. But I like it a lot. And there's a few things you can do specifically with it. Like you can share like a code block. I could hit a button on this terminal right now and share the output of a command online. Oh, wow. That's cool. And the other big thing it has is it has like an AI command search. So I want to download the contents of this file and output them to this folder. And it will like write the curl command for me. Or the other day I was like, how do I write this command to like regex this thing? And it just writes it for you. That's cool. I never use it, but I think just a command in Vim, you can do that. If I want to dump the contents of a file to a different file, yeah, it's like colon R file name or something like that. But definitely no shell interactivity. Like I would have to do like the full curl command right. like you were saying. That's really cool. Yeah. But yeah, I'm just rolling regular old terminal. <laughs> Whether US East 1 is down or you forgot to add a configuration file, everyone has an outage from time to time. When your next outage occurs, transparency is critical. The difference between a minor annoyance that people soon forget and a fiasco that creates sustained resentment is in how you communicate. That's why you need Honey Badger. Honey Badger will be a crucial component of your incident response plan with their uptime monitoring service that now has an exciting new feature, public status pages. Create a new status page with custom domains, branding, and more. Don't let Twitter be the only way your users can find out if your app is down. Sign up for Honey Badger to improve your incident response with a shiny new status page that you will be proud to show your users. Visit honeybadger.io and start giving your users a better experience today and let them know Remote Ruby sent you. Thanks to Honey Badger for their continued support of Remote Ruby. Was it been like two years ago now? I think you had tried to get me on a T-Mux at one point. I dabbled on it for a while. 
and I put it away. And then actually earlier today, Steve Polito mentioned something to me on Twitter about adding in TMUX, which I'll open it up every now and then. But honestly, like I'm not opposed to just having several terminal tabs right. open. And like, I've just gotten used to working that way. Like I always know like the code that I'm working on is in tab one. Tab two is for if I want to get into the Rails console or IRB. And then the next one is usually where my server is running. And then I'll just command whatever number between them. Yeah, I've been using TMUX for a long time. It was a tool that was introduced to me very early on in my career. And I've been using it ever since. And Overmind, which is the process manager I use, also uses TMUX under the hood. So Mm -hmm. that's kind of perfect for me. But the biggest reason I use TMUX specifically is because I have a bad habit of hitting command Q on uh, my oh, terminal. Sure. I'll leave in a server running. It was just like all any, this, any like, process. If you're not using Tmux, everything's just gone. And you're like, crap, now I gotta go restart everything. Mm-hmm. And if you're running multiple processes and if you're running Docker, it's like, ugh. So Tmux runs all these processes like in the background and you can like connect to them. Mm-hmm. And so that has saved my bacon tons and tons of times. I'm like, oh, crap, I just hit command Q again. But it's okay because I can just reopen it and reattach my Tmux session and I'm off of the races. And I know there's a ton of Tmux stuff you can do with Vim. I see Vim and Tmux often combined together. So Yeah, I think it's pretty popular for a lot of folks. Yeah, I used to write my own Tmux config, but then some change in Tmux happened and I couldn't figure out how to upgrade the config. So now these days, if you search, oh, my Tmux, and it will Mm. basically like set up like a Tmux file for you with some basic settings and it's very easy to configure and that's been working well for me so far. And just to like very quickly set because I don't want to update my Tmux config that much. It's not mm-hmm. the greatest syntax in the world. So yeah, I'm trying to remember now for a while I was doing, uh, I forget what the command is now. It's run a process in the background in the terminal, but I was doing that for a while. Like I would start up my server. This was like to get around having multiple tabs open. I would start mm-hmm. up a server in the background and then just open Vim in the same window there. But I ran into that same problem where like shut down everything and then like, go eat lunch and come back and try and start my server and it's still running in the background somewhere. And I'm like, Oh, great. Now I got to go. What's the command again to find like the running process? What is yep. it? I got to P kill whatever to kill it. Oh, and I started yeah. back up. So I got off of that train pretty quickly because <laughs> I did it so many times. I was like, this clearly isn't working for me. That's the command I searched the other day. I couldn't remember the exact syntax. So on warp, I just used the AI command search and it was like, find process running on port 3000 and kill it. And it wrote uh-huh. the command for me. That's amazing. I remember like the kill dash nine PID part. I can never remember how to find the process on port 3000 or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. It's like LSOF or something like that. I don't know. Oh man, I don't remember. I, I want to say it's like PSA or something like that, like to list them all out. I don't remember. I always have ask, to look it up. Let me ask Warp real quick. Yeah, I was going to I was gonna say, ask you for your friend. Find there. process on port 3000 and kill it. And it shows you like all the commands, like the actual ones. So it literally just says, suggest a command, L-S-O-F dash I colon oh, yeah, 3000. And then you can grep listen awk print two. I don't know if you need that part, but then it's Zarg's kill dash nine. Nice. Zarg. So it Great. works perfectly. I nice. love that so much. Yeah. It saves me so much time. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Because again, like I got it wrong. I was the thing is PSA. I mean, I'm not trying to make a public service announcement here. I'm just trying to yeah. kill a process. That might be another way to do it, though. That's yeah. also the thing I found is like it will suggest things, but sometimes there's multiple ways of doing things. One more advert for Warp. <laughs> they have these things called workflows. It has all these ones built into it. Warp has a command palette, too. So if I mm. look in workflows, it will just list off like tons and tons of workflows that are built in, like for awk and Chef and Cypress and Firebase and Laravel and Mac and SSH and Xcode and Yarn and et cetera, et cetera. Hey, like wait, the, all these. These are built in. These already? are built in. Oh, wow. But then you can add your own workflows. So like I have a couple simple ones, but the best one is that you can add repository specific workflows. So mm. for Podia, I want to be able to run the Heroku console using the Podia application or maybe I want to use the staging one. So I have a bunch of repository workflows just for the Podia app that will do these specific things. I think that's so freaking cool. Yeah, that's really cool. And this is on Warp. Warp. W-A-R-P. Check that out. Yeah. We'll put a link in the show notes. It's very cool. There you go. Definitely recommend it. at least checking it out. 
Yeah. If nothing else, the AI command search just saves me so much time from having to Google things. Sure. Yeah, I probably won't use it. Just knowing how I like to roll, I like to kind of just go with the minimal built-in stuff. Yeah. But I'm always interested to check things out just to see because it might give me ideas for things that I can just write on my own for my setup. Yeah, I really like the workflows that they have built in because you can kind of just get an idea of like, oh, maybe this would be a really great alias for me. Lists all globally installed NPM packages. I didn't know you could do that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's very helpful. Launch tabs with all tabs in your clipboard. I didn't know you could do that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So yeah, pick up some warp. So how long have you been doing Vim? Because when we first met, you were not using Vim. Oh, I was not. Let's see. Probably for the last five or six months, maybe a little bit longer. What are we in right now? October? I think right about, actually, now that I think about it, right about when I joined GoRails is when I kind of went all in on it. I think I spent like the first month or two just kind of using the Vim for VS Code plugin. Just kind of like really get practice using those commands and not have to worry about anything else. Like I still have all my functionality in VS Code to like, search for things and stuff, but just learn how to move around like within a file and some of the more like hipper commands that I use all the time now. Like right. I love being able to just say like CT underscore in whatever word I'm on, I can change from where the cursor is to the underscore that the, like the first underscore in front of it and have it automatically like drop me into insert mode and I can just replace that chunk. So that's where I really like hone those skills. And once I felt good about that, and just being able to do my edits and move around in the file, that's when I kind of just dropped BS Code altogether and tried to use Vim as my daily driver. Occasionally, I would have to still open it up again to like do like a global search or something. Right. I didn't know how to do it in Vim yet. So my whole approach was like, let me master like a few commands and then I can add more on top of that once I don't have to think about these other ones anymore. So it was a very much like a slow evolution. But like I said, yeah, that was like a month or two. And then I think... Probably sometime around March, end of February, March is when I went. Nice. Vim daily driver. I have tried to learn Vim off and on for a year, probably. I got pretty far one time, but then I think I went back to work. Whoever I was pairing with that day was also a Vim user. So like Mm -hmm. they were seeing me do things like, oh, you can do it like this and you can do it like this. And I was like, I was just overwhelmed and not moving fast enough. So I was like, I'm just turning this off. And then I never turned it back on. And the other day I was talking to my coworker, Harry, and he was like, dude, you got to get on this Vim train, man. I'm telling you. So like I flew to LA recently for Rails SaaS comp and like the whole flight, I was just in Vim tutor practicing. So I think I'm going to give it another go. I just need to turn it on and just use it and not worry about being slow. But it's hard for me to not worry about that. Yeah, that's definitely the right mindset, I think, to have going into. Like just be comfortable in the fact that you're going to struggle for a bit. Right. The other thing that I found that helped me too was, you know, because you'll have to hit escape a bunch to get out of like insert mode or visual mode or whatever to get back into normal mode. Yeah, so caps lock. I, yeah, what I, see, I already I have that. Oh, okay. Well, see, you're already set up for success there. Yeah. When I cut you off, but you were going to say configuring the caps lock key to be escape. Yep, exactly. Instead of having to make that big pinky reach all the yeah. way up to the, well, I guess, depending on your keyboard. Put on a normal regular keyboard, that top left big right. reach for your pinky. It's kind of, it's a stretch. Yeah. And on my keyboard, I use a, an ultimate hacking keyboard. So it's split. It doesn't have all the same keys and everything. So I have to hit like a modifier key and then the tilde to mm-hmm. hit escape. So yeah. it's like two fingers, like hang 10. Yeah. Yeah. That's that funny you said that uh, cause I had one of those CSA Moonlander keyboards I just sold like last week. Yeah. And the escape key on that one was kind of like where the space bar is. So it's split. And there's like this weird triangular key on both sides, like in the thumb pad. And on the right side, that was the escape. And like, I could never figure out like a good way to hit it. I would either have to like pivot my right wrist inward and tap it with my index finger or do like shaka the surf uh, up and like slap it with my thumb. And I didn't find either one of those to be comfortable doing. Right. Yeah. I definitely like it on the caps lock key. And also like, I don't miss having the caps lock key because now like when I'm typing in them and if I need to do something all caps... I'll just type it out normal and there's a Vim command. You can like, I think it's G capital U, A word or inner word. So G capital U, A W. And then that whole thing will be capitalized. So I don't nice. really miss it all that much. And I rarely have to do that. So yeah, I never use caps lock anyway. So even saying, if I yeah. have to write in all caps, I usually just hold shift. 
So oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. like, I don't need this key anyway. I'll do that sometimes it's so too. It's like, if it's short, I'll hold shift and type my word. Yeah, get rid of the caps lock. Maybe if you don't even map it to escape for other people, like that could be a good hyper key. And a hyper key being the combination of command, control, shift, option. Mm -hmm. I have an extra three keys on my keyboard that is a add-on basically to it. The closest one to my thumb is what I use for the hyper key. And so I have all these like global commands set up, mapped to that key and like a key press for like moving windows or triggering certain applications to run specific things. And I've been a big fan of using that recently. Nice. Yeah. I have a, so in Vim, like a lot of things you want to hear like the control key for and then something else, which I don't particularly find comfortable either. So I remapped a lot of things. So you have like a leader key, it's called in Vim, which is something you hit before doing like some other command. Right. So I just mapped my leader to space bar now. And then the commands that I found myself doing often that use control, I just modified them now to say like leader and then whatever the other part is. For example, right. well, this isn't really a built-in BIM one, but I find myself like often wanting to like open the schema file in a Rails app. So I'll just do leader, which is space FC, and then it'll just open the schema file in a new tab for me and put me right there. Yeah. If I have multiple windows, if I have a window that's split in several different places, to hop around there, you have to do like control W and then like a direction, mm -hmm. which I don't like doing either. So now I just do like space W and then the direction and done. And nice. space is just a bigger target to hit. My thumb's already right there. I don't have to think yeah. about it. So yeah, that's a good one. I don't know. I like changing my keyboard settings, but I'm trying not to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so many options. The one weird thing I do is that I almost never use the laptop keyboard on my Macs. I've always had like external keyboards, external monitors, et cetera. And in the beginning, I used like a Windows keyboard and I never liked where command was placed. So I switched it to where the control button was on a Windows keyboard. But that habit has like persisted even today. So I still don't like where the command key is. Like I have a Mac layout on this keyboard, but I still don't like where I have to move my fingers to like hit the command key. So I've still keep it on the control so I can just hit with my pinky. Where's it at on your keyboard? Is is it not by like where your thumb is or would be like normally? No, because my thumb rests on like a mod key and okay, then sure. the command key is two keys to the left. So I have to like move my thumb inward underneath all the way, like, all the oh, way on the yeah. side of my hand. Oh, that's awkward. And yeah, it is awkward. So I just map it to command or I just map that to control and I map the other the, the control key to command. But I yeah. only do that on the left side. Sure. So when you go to like a conference or something, you bring in just your laptop, do you struggle like with typing because you're using no. it normally or you can adjust easily? I don't have a hyper key on my built-in laptop thing. I usually use my iPad nowadays at conferences, but the command key isn't as hard to hit on the laptop keyboard mm -hmm. for some yeah, reason. Yeah, because it's right there at the thumb level. Right. Next, because next to the space. Yeah, yeah. Because of the layout of this keyboard and there's a, a mod button and the mod button's pretty big. It's bigger than the other keys. So yeah, I think that's just why now. But it nice. used to be because I was on a Windows layout. Yeah. Makes sense. I'm still rocking VS Code. I have no plans to quit. Yeah. I also have some of the stuff that you were talking about earlier, like switching to the views or the tests or whatever. There's a plugin called Rails Fast Nav. I use for that, which is awesome. And what was the other one? You said flipping into tests. I think that one will do it too. But there's also a plugin called Rails Flip Flop, which will just open the test file in the pane next to you. Mm. I enjoy that one as well. I'm thinking there might be some more VS Code content coming from me in the future. We'll see. But yeah, I'm still bullish on VS Code. Even if I switch to Vim, I doubt I'll switch out of VS Code at this point. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you, so in your VS Code setup, like when you open it up, do you have like the sidebar showing, the terminal showing, other stuff showing? Like, is it split up a bunch of ways? Because the reason I asked and what helped me get into Vim or like why I wanted to go more Vim is because we talked about it the other day. I forget the guy's name who wrote it, but the Make VS Code Not Suck book. I think that's what's it. Make VS Code yeah. Awesome. Make VS Code Awesome. That's it. Well, I guess that's, I was kind of right though too, right? Make, yeah, yeah. Make it not suck. <laughs> I went through that too. And if you follow through that book, it obliterates everything off the screen yeah. where it's just like a blank palette, right? There's nothing there. And I actually like that a lot. When I got into Vim and rolling in the terminal with that, there's nothing there. Only the file you have open is what you see. And I really like that. 
but I know a lot of other people like seeing the file tree there, like having the terminal built in. So I'm just curious about like what your layout's like. Yeah, I followed that as well. I have since majorly modified some of the suggestions, but there's a plugin called Customize UI. It basically modifies the code for the display and you can use like CSS basically to turn things on and off as if you built in things that you can turn on and off. And so, yes, I do use that. And so my window is like frameless. Like there's not even a close button on it. It's literally just at mm-hmm. the top of the window. It's just the uh, VS Code tabs. And I think VS Code now has like a search thingy like built into the top of it or whatever. That's gone. The sidebar with all the like plugins and actions on it is gone. It's at the bottom of the Explorer window now, like yeah. in horizontal. And do you just have a hotkey if you want to like open it up real quick and see? Yeah. I've always kept the Explorer on the right side of the window. I usually I like keep it too. collapsed and you can toggle it on and off with command B, which I think is what it is default. Yep. And then I just have a command to quickly open and close the terminal faster than the one that comes in built in with VS Code. My VS Code like probably doesn't look like most people's and I think it's very clean and I like it. Yeah. I still have it installed on my machine. I don't ever open it, but I have my Explorer on the right too. And mainly because before when it was on the left and you open it up, it like your whole screen shifts yeah. over to the right. It's quite jarring. I don't particularly like that. So putting it over to the right was a nice change when I was still using that a bunch. Yeah, I think I'm right eye dominant. I use an ultra wide monitor. So I keep my code on the right and then my browser on the left. Because of that, it makes more sense for the Explorer to be on the right side. So it's more so in my peripheral vision than like in the mm-hmm. middle of my screen. Yep, makes sense. Speaking of wide screens, did you get a new one? I, did, I saw your monitor died the other yeah, day. Yeah, it's dead, dude. I don't know. It's, did you get it, another yet or no? Not yet. I have another one. I have two. Oh, okay. The one that died, I was using as a vertical monitor on the left side mm-hmm. of my main one. And that's where I would keep like the terminal and my Obsidian notes and Slack and Discord and all that other stuff. And I don't need necessarily another monitor. I'm probably going to get one, but I'm kind of deciding on what to do and if I want to spend the money to get a nice one or what. But I could just keep rocking with one window. Today, I opened up my laptop just so I could have like a second screen for Slack and stuff. That's interesting. I pretty much full screen everything. I don't have Discord over here, blah, blah, blah. Right. I like to just focus on my thing at hand that I'm doing and not like be distracted by all the other stuff going on. So I have a wide monitor too. I guess I just appreciate the space, but I, right. everything I do, I just like full screen it out. Whereas I feel like at least a lot of the people I know tend to have split setups. Either it's multiple monitors and they're putting things all over the place or they have their main monitors split a bunch of ways. Yeah. I have like keyboard commands to like move windows and all that stuff. I use better touch tool to handle like the window moving and stuff. And it allows you to like save a layout basically. Sure. So like I can hit my hyper key and then the key I have assigned to do that. And then it will like automatically position all the windows like where I normally have them for like work stuff. And then if I hit it again, it flips it again to like another layout that I use a lot. So Mm. I like that a lot. Fun. Yeah, that's cool. You might like the new stage manager feature that is coming out with macOS Ventura. Is that the latest one, Ventura? I think it is. I think so too. I think I saw somebody in the Discord make a joke about it being Ace Ventura. So I think you're right about that. I think you mentioned that to me not too long ago too. I need to check that out because I haven't even looked into what all comes with that or like what you can do with that. It switches you into this mode of like the one window in the screen, but on the left side of the window, it shows you like kind of almost like the minimized other applications you have opened. Mm. And so you can like quickly switch to them. I don't know. It's like for people who work kind of like one window at a time, or especially if you're on a smaller screen, Mm -hmm. it might come in handy. I use it sometimes and sometimes I switch it back to the normal mode. Like I don't use it at work, but sometimes when I'm doing personal stuff, I will. Sure. Yeah, I'll have to check it out. Like I said, I usually keep everything kind of full screened. Sometimes I'll minimize things. And what I used to hate doing is like, so you minimize something, but then to bring it back up, I used to think you had to like go down and then click it to get it back open. But I found, so like you have something open, you command M to minimize it. Yep. And then if you like command tab onto whatever you want to bring back up before you like let go, you hit option and then let go of like the tab key and it'll bring it back up Uh again. Yeah, I didn't know about that. Yeah, there's your tip for the week there, folks. I know Command H will hide it. 
So mm. don't want to do that one. Yeah. Man, um, minimize. Yeah. I'll have to, I'll have to try yeah. that because yeah. I ran into that the other day. Yeah. I used to run into it all the time. I was like, there's gotta be a way to do this. Yeah. yeah. So you just tab over to it while holding command and then just hold option before you let go to the other keys. And there you go. Nice. Well, one last thing on, I guess, workflow stuff. I'm a big Alfred user. I know we were talking about this the other night. I was trying to, yeah. I was trying to get you on it. Whether it's Alfred or Raycast, I think replacing Spotlight with one of these more advanced tools can do a lot for your workflow. Like I showed you the other night, I if I want to like search Ruby gems for a gem, I open Alfred, which is just what it is for Spotlight, which is command space. And then I can type RG and then the name of the gem and it will automatically search Ruby gems for that gem name. And the same with N- MDN and NPM and Google and DuckDuckGo and YouTube and Twitter. So like these built-in searches are really helpful for me. I can type GH and then a GitHub repo and it will automatically take me to that GitHub repo. Like that GitHub thing has more commands built into it, but I mostly just use it to navigate GitHub quickly. Sure. Automatically searching documentation with Dash. I have a few other helper ones built in. I've built my own workflows, like quickly go to certain windows for work and stuff. If I type in Podia space, it has all these different options for like, Open up the app in VS Code, open up the production in Safari, open up development in Safari, open up different subdomains. Nice. So I use that. Yeah, that one seemed really cool. I think that's going to be one I'm going to look into over this, the weekend, perhaps, and check out. Because just like when you showed me the search in Ruby Gems, I was like, oh, that's great. <laughs> so like, yeah. I can only imagine, like you said, all the different areas you can expand that out to. So I think that's one I'm going to definitely be opting into. Yeah. And I told this to you, I'll tell it to everyone else. If you're thinking like, oh, that sounds really cool, but I don't really need a new tool. Here's the thing. It is better than Spotlight, in my opinion. I think in a lot of people's opinions, like whether it's Raycast or whether it's Alfred, it's just better. So all you have to do is switch to one of them. You don't have to install any plugins, just literally replace Spotlight with it first. And then you can start adding in workflows and like these searches and like other stuff, like it comes with all a lot of stuff built in, but I think you can do like gradually discovering that instead of like yeah. trying to figure it all out at once. Cause it has like snippets built in and mm-hmm. it has all this kind of stuff you can do, like automatically yeah. like showing previews of files. There's so much stuff you can do with it, but at its base, it's just a spotlight replacement. So just use it like that and then start to discover these new tools. And I will say I am one of those. I don't need another tool people. It sounds interesting enough for me. I at least want to try it out. And I would do it the same way, like you just said, like just start default setup and not yeah. try and do anything crazy and just learn that, see if I like it and then look further into what it can do if I enjoy it, you know? So. Yeah. Alfred had a big update recently, which added a bunch of new features, which are really cool. Like you can actually create quick actions now that you can access in Finder. It's so like in Finder, you can like right click mm-hmm. on a file and then perform certain actions on it. And you can actually create your own with Alfred. You can do a lot of really great file navigation stuff, like opening it like certain ways. Like it, it's so cool. Yeah. That's cool. I know Jason and Chris both use it as well. I think Chris has a similar setup. Like you were saying, like he can just jump to a GitHub repo. Yeah. Something like a GH command and a repo name or something like that. And same yeah. Ruby gems. Just those two things alone to me sound amazing. I'm definitely intrigued by it. Yeah. It's super great. Any other workflow things that we want to discuss or anything else going on before we wrap it up? I don't think so. I would say to people that are like just getting into that, find the things that you're doing often that you don't want to type out the full command for and go start playing with some aliases. Maybe start small, don't write a bunch so that you can remember them and then just yeah. add over time. Yeah, I agree. And I would try to review them maybe. One thing I've done in the past is like if I find myself repeating something over and over, I'll just write it down in a note somewhere mm-hmm. and then... Mm-hmm. I will like maybe go back to that note and be like, oh, I do run this command a lot. So let's find an alias for it. And then like in a month, if I'm not using that alias, I'll delete it. There's a lot of value, I think, to not having all these crazy plugins and all these crazy aliases because the likelihood of you using all of them is very minimal and it does have an effect on the load time of your terminal. So yeah, Yeah. start simple. Yeah. And I would also say keep them organized too. Like I think I pretty much mine are all like they're grouped by like what they operate on and then they're alphabetical within that. Yeah. So yeah, there's nothing worse than something not working in your environment and you not having any idea why. Mm. So I think it's definitely beneficial to like understand at least from like a high level what's happening. Yeah. So agreed. Well, Colin, thank you for joining me today. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for asking me to hop on. It's a good time. Well, everyone else, hopefully Chris will be back soon and Jason will be back in a few weeks. 
And we will catch you all then. See you later.